Thank you, Erica, very much for being here and um, giving this talk. Um, I'm just going to briefly in introduce you to everyone and then and hand over the stage uh, to you. So uh, Erica Thompson is an associate professor for modeling for decision making at um, UCL's Department of Science, Technology, Engineering and Public Policy. Um, she's also a fellow, fellow of the London Mathematical Laboratory and a visiting senior fellow at the LSE Data Science Institute. I, I would call her um, an interdisciplinary meta modeling expert. Um, she publishes broadly um, about the use of models, um, how to properly use them, how to maybe also not use them. And given that also we in the urban domain and in the city science realm and the digital city um, realm, are more and more going into these topics such as digital twins and more and more simulations are being used for planning um, and everybody wants to enter model land uh, i thought that it's uh, very important to know also how to escape from model land which is the book that um, erica wrote um, and in that she um, distinguishes very nicely between like the real world and the model world and what we can do with models and what we can also not do with models and how we can use them ethically which will also be the um, topic of today's talk. Um, she published to, um, in a lot of topics such as climate change, public health, economics, um, many peer reviewed articles, but she also appears frequently in uh, podcasts and write contributions in the non-scientific domain to sort of bridge also these worlds um, from the scientific and non-scientific world. Um, she also, I, I read on her, your homepage, on her homepage that, um, she aims to reduce her carbon footprint to one world level, which is why she's here with us digitally today. And I think that's great. Uh, and I would like to hand over the virtual stage to you. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Well, thank you so much, Rico, for the invitation. It's great to be here with you all. And thanks for the kind words about the book. Um, indeed, I don't fly or I haven't been on a plane since 2008, I think now. So uh but of course, one can get to Hamburg on the train. So that's not completely the reason. I also have two small children. So I'm, uh, you know, I prefer to stay at home as much as possible as well. Um, OK, so let me uh, share my screen and then say a bit about what I'm going to talk about today. Hopefully you can all see that. Can everybody see it? Yep, great. Um, so uh, a bit about me then. So Rico's already introduced me. Um, and what I work on at the moment. But I thought maybe it would be helpful to say a bit about my history and how I got to this point and sort of why I became interested in these questions about models and how they work. Um, okay, so let's just dive straight in. So I did a PhD, um, which is getting on for 10, 15 years ago now, uh, on North Atlantic storms. So my background was in maths and physics, and I thought, let's do something useful. Let's do climate change. That sounds fun. It sounds important. Um, and so the first thing I did was a literature review about what the models said would happen to North Atlantic storms given climate change. So I was interested in looking at these different models and maybe drawing out some common themes and trying to think how we can make better models. And so I started making kind of tabulating the uh, the outputs from different models. And what I kind of began to realize, you know, quite early on in my PhD study was that the models were all telling us different things. Some of them said the North Atlantic storm tracks were going to move northward. Some said they were going to move southward. Some said the storms would get more intense. Some said they would get less intense. Some said they'd get more frequent. Some said they'd get less frequent. And so I kind of built up this picture and I realized that they didn't even agree within their own error bars, you know, that there wasn't really an overlap of the confidence between these different models. And so I realized that it hadn't told me very much at all about North Atlantic storms and it hadn't, hadn't told me very much at all about climate change, but it was telling me a lot about models, modeling, the way that we do models, maybe the way that we overestimate our confidence in models and we fail to fully um, fully understand the levels of uncertainty and the error bars that we might draw around our model predicted ranges. And so that experience, I mean, I, I finished the PhD and it was mostly about the models and doing the modeling. Um, but I really was sort of stuck on this question of what does it actually mean? What does the model output actually mean? <laughs> you know, what what is it? What is this thing that's a model? Because we know it's not perfect and it's not going to give us perfect predictions of the future. Um, and we know 
a sort of by demonstration that our uncertainty levels are probably higher than we think they are from the model, how should we be doing this? You know, this methodological question of what is a model and what can it do for us? Um, and so then I spent the next uh, 10 or so years working on a series of different projects about the use of modeling for decision making. So, you know, it hadn't completely disillusioned me. I was still there, still doing it, um, still thinking about how how models can be used and what kind of information we can get. But with this, you know, this knowledge in the back of my mind always that models are not perfect and thinking about how to do that, how to deal with that. So um, one example of something that I was working on uh, was use of models for humanitarian decision making. So this is Madagascar. And um, I was working with some humanitarian agencies to think about what they should do and when and with how much confidence when there's a prediction that a, a hurricane or a cyclone in the southwest Indian Ocean uh, was kind of coming towards Madagascar and might, you know, hit and cause damages and uh, risk people's lives. And so there's lots of things that they can do in advance, um, but they need to have enough confidence to be able to release the funding and to be able to take those actions and importantly to be able to kind of justify those actions to the to the funders and the donors um, and to the affected communities. So I found that a really interesting case study. I mean, so the picture I've drawn here is a, you know, the, the spaghetti plot of the cyclone tracks. And so you can see that there's quite high confidence at this point of knowing where it's going to go. But of course, you can equally imagine a spaghetti plot that goes crazy and you just don't know which way it's going to go. So how do you then uh, sort of work that into an operational decision making procedure? And so I sort of carried on in this vein and, you know, it'll be familiar to the uh, academics here that um, I was on a series of short term projects as a as a, a postdoc on, you know, small fixed term things happening with deliverables. And uh, so there was the weather stuff, the climate stuff, some things on energy, some things on humanitarian action. Um, and some things on uh, financing, because that's the kind of next step up is to say, well, if we have these models, um, so in the humanitarian context, for example, we might say, OK, we can construct a some way of releasing funding based on a forecast of a cyclone. But actually, we want to then integrate that into a larger scheme. We want to think about operational um you know, so, some kind of larger risk pool because we can just do it on single events. But ultimately, we're trying to do all of the events. And again, it's highly model dependent. It depends what you think the overall level of risk is. And you don't want to underestimate that because your scheme will run out of money. But also you don't want to overestimate it because then your scheme will be have loads of money left over that could have been doing something useful. And so this very much overlaps with information for climate change adaptation, uh, with climate services, with insurance, with reinsurance, um, and this kind of disaster risk reduction theme. So those were all the sorts of things that I'd been thinking about uh, sort of 12 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago. Um, and I'd been thinking about trying to bring these themes together, you know, to, to kind of take this overarching theme of what do the models actually do for us and how do we deal with them and how do we use them, importantly, for operational decision making. And then suddenly there was this huge case study of the use of models for decision making in practice, playing out in real time and in the tops of the newspapers, at the top of the political agenda. And of course, that was the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, and maybe what I want to stress here is just the way that this um, exemplifies, I think, really nicely the way that models are not just used to support decisions, they're also used uh, kind of in justificatory mode to justify decisions. You know, that that there's, there's this interaction between the, say, the uh, epidemiologists and the government, and they talk about it, and the model is kind of a boundary object there, which is used to... Uh, facilitate those discussions to decide what to do, but then also the um, either the uh, policymakers or perhaps their scientific advisors have to stand up in front of the public and explain why we've made these decisions. And again, the model is used to justify and to communicate and to uh, to kind of demonstrate 
to a less technical audience why you've done something. So you might think, for example, of this uh, little animation on the right, which is the this idea of flattening the curve, which was so prevalent around um, early 2020, this idea that we can, you know, if we take action, we can reduce the number of cases. And obviously this is very model-based because this is, the curve is from a model you know, just just a sketch drawn, but an understanding of a kind of SEIR epidemiology model. So that model has kind of traveled outside its scientific context into a policymaking context and into a public public understanding context as well. And it's lost some of the details and the nuances, but it has, um, you know, it's kind of gained that communicative power. So there's loads to say about that. And so that was incredibly um you know, it, it was a difficult time for various reasons, obviously, um, for me personally, as well as for everybody. Um, but it was just a really interesting case study of how these models are actually in practice being used. And what I think, you know, we saw there as well was the these questions about models and what kind of information we genuinely get from them coming to the fore of the of the public interest as well you know these communications of worst case scenarios well what does this worst case scenario mean is it a prediction is it not a prediction you know and then so to sort of seeing these curves and the scientists saying but it's not a prediction no it's not a prediction and and everybody kind of in the public sphere going oh no it's a prediction <laughs> and this this kind of lack of um you know, in some senses, a real lack of connection. And then in other senses, a huge connection, because this this idea of flattening the curve and this picture are so powerful and so simple and so strong and so good at communicating. Um, and yet the nuances being really lost on the way and this misunderstanding perhaps also of, um, you know, the, the agenda perhaps or the information constraints on the decision maker and the modeler and the policymaker. So there's, you know, there's, there was so much kind of to say there. And so, and so that was the context, I guess, in which I was writing my book. So thank you very much, Rico, for mentioning it. Here's uh, my book, Escape from Model Land. Um, and, and so what I was aiming to do with that book was to bring together these themes and to say, you know, there are, there are philosophical questions which are kind of unanswered, but maybe we can answer them. Um, and there are technical questions which we as scientists really ought to be thinking more about, but also there are social and political questions. You know, there's this context of models. Um, there's a, there are socio-political influences upon models and the modeling process, however much we might like to pretend that there isn't, you know, they, it's always there. Um, and and what can we do about that? You know, or or can we just understand it a bit better? So to say a bit more about what I mean by escaping from model land. Um, so, so my idea of model land is kind of where you are when you are actually like inside the model. You know, you've written down your system of equations or you've programmed something on the computer or maybe you have a, just a flowchart on the back of the envelope. As far as I'm concerned, those are all models. Um, but, but you're sort of inside the boundary of that. You've made your assumptions and inside that boundary, those assumptions are true everything works you can you can you can kind of run through making predictions if that's what your model does um and everything just works right and so that's great but it has zero relevance to real life you know nobody cares and nobody should care about what your model says until you make some assertion that it has something to do with real life because nobody lives in model land. We don't make decisions in model land. We don't experience impacts in model land. We experience them in the real world. And so, you know, incumbent on the modelers is this responsibility to get out of model land. We have to, we have to take the statements that we've made about the model and somehow make a leap back to the real world to transfer those inferences, those judgments from the model to reality. And so how do we do that? Okay, so how do we escape from model land? Um, and so the thesis of my book really is that there are two primary escapes from model land and that these are not these are not kind of two completely separate things. They are maybe ends of a spectrum rather than being a binary choice. Um, 
And the first, of course, is data. So anyone involved in making a model, if you say, how do you get out of model land? Of course, the answer is you go and look for data and you check your model against the data that you've gathered. Hopefully that's out of sample data and not just the, mod the data that you use to calibrate the model in the first place, because that would definitely be cheating. Um, but if you can find some out of sample data, so maybe you've calibrated your model up to 2015 and then you use your data from 2015 to 2024 um, to test the model, for example. Um, and you say, was it any good in the past? And you hope, but of course it's no guarantee that past performance is uh, in some way reflective of future performance. And so we can do that. And there are situations where we might have lots of data and they might be very relevant data and we can generate a high level of confidence based on past data that the model will be good in the future. So that is one way of escaping from model land for a certain set of models that I'll talk about later. And then the second way of getting out of model land is a bit more difficult because this one is about expert judgment. It's about making, it's about, you know, how we understand the quality of the model. Are the assumptions that we've made in the construction of this model likely to continue to be true in future? You know, those assumptions that made it good in the past, are they going to be equally true in the future? And so, right, that's a difficult question and it, it has may be completely different answers depending on what you're talking about. Because if I've made a completely physical model, you know, based on the laws of physics, I can say that I, you know, I really have very high confidence that the laws of physics are going to be true tomorrow as they were yesterday. Um, and so I have very high confidence that that will still, that will continue to be a good model. So like if I throw a basketball or something, you know, the, the trajectory of that ball is something that in principle, if I have enough data about what this ball looks like and the, uh, you know, the air resistance and the, I don't know, the wind speed, anything else that's going on, that I would be able to do that really, really well, you know, in principle with, you know, arbitrary levels of accuracy. But if we're talking about uh, at the other end of the spectrum, anything social with respect to humans, you know, um, thinking about COVID-19 and the projections for um, infections in six months time, let's say, you know, that's a very much a function of politics and um, and society, people's attitudes, people's choices, events that might happen that we just don't know about. And the uh, possibility, for example, of um, new variants of this disease that might have different characteristics from the ones that we've seen in the past. So our confidence that the assumptions that the model is built on, um, you know, we might have high confidence in those assumptions in the past, but we don't have such high confidence that they will continue to apply in the future. And so we need to make an expert judgment. So this is what I always come back to is this um, necessity for expert judgment and that that will be based on our expert understanding of the, you know, whatever the situation is. Um, and it is limited in certain ways, it's biased in certain ways, and uh, and it's also good in many ways. You know, I, I sort of constantly tread this line between saying we need to be really careful, and yet also we need to ensure that we are making the most of the information that we do genuinely have. Okay, so just to say maybe a little bit more about that question of data. Um, so here's I've just drawn a little scatter plot of some arbitrary data. Well, what do we do with that? If we're trying to make a model, maybe we fit a line through it. Maybe we say, oh, I think I could get a slightly better model if I fitted a quadratic through it. Okay. Um, how confident are we going to be in our use of the model to project the next outcome? Well, if we are if the next outcome is basically within the domain of the uh, data that we already have, then we are essentially interpolating. And in that interpolatory regime, it doesn't really matter whether you fitted a, a linear fit or a quadratic or something else. It's not going to make a huge amount of difference. Um, I mean, OK, you could you could draw a situation where it would make a huge amount of difference, but in general, it probably doesn't because you are pinned back to the data that you've got. So as long as you've got enough data, you're your choices about the model are probably going to be, you know, relatively unimportant. 
But of course, as soon as we go out of that domain of the previous data, then we are extrapolating. And that's the point where the assumptions that we've made and the question of what functional form we've chosen to fit this model become extremely important, you know, to the extent of basically going off to infinity in different directions, right? So it can be huge. The, the potential error is unbounded. Um, so how do we know sort of where we are? You know, I'm going to distinguish between these data-driven models where I think where I think you can just say, let's just take more data, where you can, for example, use AI and machine learning and, and just set them loose on it because, because it doesn't actually matter the functional form so much. If we're going into these assumption-driven regimes outside of the interpolatory question outside of the domain of the data that we have previously had and the domain of applicability of our model you know in the, within that white box we are confident because we've got the data that the model applies well but outside that box we just don't know we have to make an expert judgment and so if we set our machine learning uh, model onto doing that it could do something crazy and how would we know how would we how would we go back and check that it isn't doing something really crazy and how do we how do we sort of cross calibrate it well there's there's kind of no way to do that apart from by taking more data okay so uh maybe just to distinguish between the types of models that are in each of those domains then so data driven models i would say include the weather forecast if you take your phone out of your pocket and look at the weather forecast you have a good understanding you know, not that that model is perfect, but you know how confident you should be in it. And it might even tell you, depending on what forecast you look at, you know, that it gives you a probability of rain, say. Um, and, and you have built up a personal understanding and the information provider has a technical understanding of how good that model is in different circumstances based on data. And, and we have confidence in it continuing to be the case. So then things like, you know, the, the flight of a basketball as well, data driven. What are the assumption driven models? Well, I think of things like um, energy policy. I think of things like um, elections. Basically, anything with a human component is going to end up in this assumption driven regime. Um, epidemiological modeling, I suppose I think of the maybe the first week as being data driven and the and the longer time scale as being assumption driven. Um, and again, the, the same with sort of climate, that on the short time scales, we have weather, and that's quite well calibrated. But on the longer time scales, we have climate, and that's dependent on uh, a large amount of expert judgments. So I could talk more about that if anyone is interested in the questions. Um, so from your point of view, then, you know, working on cities and city modeling, and as Rico said, thinking about these digital twins, you know, I'm interested to hear where you think you are on this on this spectrum. Um, you know the the concept of a digital twin i would think is is kind of mostly in that data driven regime rather than the assumption driven regime but i'm interested to hear where you think it's pushing the boundaries and or maybe going towards those those questions of um social judgments and uh contingency on things that you really don't know or have to make strong expert judgments about Okay, so one other thing that I wanted to talk about was values in models, values and value judgments. And so I've talked about expert judgments a few times, um, but I wanted to take that more explicitly into the realm of values. And again, let's go back to let's go back to basics and say that we're trying to make a model based on data. So we've got we've got a set of data and um, we have inputs, we have some output. I've kind of sketched it here in two dimensions, but uh, you know the the model is what connects the the output so your model is a function of the inputs and it generates an output so let's say it's kind of one dimensional here and we'll just draw a straight line through it but of course this could be a multi-dimensional output surface it could have a thousand dimensions but it wouldn't fit so nicely on a powerpoint slide um so how do we take our observations our data and use them to calibrate a model so Again, easy, you say we stick it into Excel or R or your favorite programming language and you uh, you use some fit and you just fit it and you get an answer, yeah? Um, well, let's take an example. So let's say we're trying to predict air temperature in, in Brighton. Now, what I want to say is that the, the way that you do this fit depends on who you are. Okay, so let's say that you are a... Um, 
you own an ice cream van and you go down to the beach in Brighton and you sell ice cream on warm days. Well, you don't you probably don't care then about whether it's going to be minus five degrees or plus two degrees because nobody is going to be on the beach wanting ice cream. So you kind of throw away this data at the bottom end of the um of the scale and you say, actually, I'm only interested uh when in the difference between maybe 23 degrees and 28 degrees, because that changes the amount of ice cream that I'm going to sell. And so you calibrate your model to be good at the top end. Now, supposing that you are a structural engineer and you are so got some big project on and you're going to be pouring concrete and you're interested in knowing the weather because you want to know whether or not your concrete will set. And if it goes below zero degrees or you know close to freezing, then there's a risk that your concrete isn't going to set properly and you'll have to dig it all up and start again. And that would be a disaster. So you're interested really not in the question of whether the air temperature is the right answer. You're interested in this binary question of whether you're going to be above or below zero, maybe with some margin for error. So let's say above or below five degrees Celsius. Um, so you kind of would transform this into a, a binary thing. It's just, can I pour my concrete? Yes or no. And then you would evaluate on that and you would you'd probably throw away the very high and very low observations and concentrate on values which are close to this threshold. And you'd calibrate your model to be good at that. And then supposing that you uh, run a hospital trust in, in the south of England and you want to know your interest in these weather forecasts, well, maybe you find that there's no impact at all on hospital admissions in the middle of the distribution and it's on the extreme days. So maybe at the extreme cold days, you've got people being admitted due to slipping on ice and on the extreme hot days, you've got people admitted due to heat stroke. Um, and so you want a model which can perform well on the tails of this distribution. And so maybe you throw away all the stuff in the middle and you're only interested in, in, the, um, in the ends and you calibrate your model to be good at the ends. So the point is really the bottom line here is that value judgments, um, you know, which are which are not arbitrary things, you know, they are good and relevant, you know, they're the question of purpose, you know, is my model good? Is is it good for the purpose to which I want to put it? And that depends on the purpose to which you want to put it, right? So this is this shouldn't be too controversial. But that value judgments go all the way back into how we use our data, right? As far as the nitty gritty of, you know, taking what data we choose to take and how we choose to use those to calibrate a model in the very first instance. You know, it's not something that just kind of ends up at the at the end of the line. Oh, you know, should we do this? Should we do that? It's it's right there in the maths from the beginning. OK, and so maybe then to say a bit more about ethics and value judgments. Let's think again about um, COVID and these kind of, I'm sure you've all seen this graph. This is from the uh, Imperial College model that was circulated, you know, around the beginning of March 2020, when there really wasn't very much information at all. There wasn't much data um, and people, so in, this is a, a UK based graph, um, but it was quite influential globally. Um, these questions of well, what should we do about it? You know, what what decisions should we take in the very short term, and how is that going to influence the long term? And so they were making these models, which are, are like as you can see, really actually really simplistic models. Um, you know, not not complex. Um, and questions of how that then was taken to policymakers. So in the UK, we have this scientific advisory group for emergencies. And uh, and and that group was kind of looking at these models and giving advice to policymakers about what they ought to be doing or what they could do, what their options would be. And then the policymakers come back and say, well, what about this? Have we thought about that? Can we can we represent this as well? So I think this raises a whole load of interesting ethical questions. And some of these you know, have started to come out, you know, in the newspapers and in the inquiry that we've had in the UK into the handling of the COVID-19 crisis. Um, but these questions, you know, coming right back to the models, whose judgments are represented in these models? Who decided what are the options that we're going to present here? Um, because obviously the the kinds of options that we are able to present to policymakers depend on the structure of the model. Because if something isn't actually represented in the structure of the model, like if we didn't have schools and universities in the model, say, 
then you wouldn't be able to represent the closure of those schools and universities to make a projection about what would happen if you did that. So the there is a very strong linkage between the policy options on the table and the technical capability of these models. Who decides what's politically feasible? I mean, if this was a, uh, you know, a, the same picture, but for an animal health outbreak, then of course we could imagine, we could think back to BSE, um, other animal health crises in the UK in the fairly recent past where, um, you know, for example, foot and mouth disease, uh, what we saw were terrible pictures of animals being culled uh, in order to stop the spread of disease. So that's a politically feasible and acceptable uh, option um, for uh, action to take to curb the spread of an outbreak for an animal disease. And of course, that's not on the table for a, a human disease outbreak. That would be completely ridiculous. Um, but that's a value judgment, right? So that's a value judgment that the that the modelers are assuming, and in this case, rightly assuming. But there are many other things. You know, there are lots of shades of gray here of what you might put into these models and what you might not put into these models. So there are value judgments all the way down, um, and some of them are explicitly discussed, and some of them are not. So we can see the same thing going on if we look in other models. This is a picture. Um, showing the uh, different energy energy system scenarios for a for a kind of baseline scenario without climate policy six different models and a two degree scenario for meeting our paris agreement targets by 2100 um with again six different models and you can see the that um We've got coal, oil, and gas used a lot in the baseline scenario. And then all of the models, of course, agree that in order to meet our two degree target, we have to use less coal, oil, and gas and rely more on renewables and probably reduce the total amount of primary energy as well. So, okay, so far so good. You see the models are all slightly different. They don't fully agree with each other because they make different assumptions, right? Okay, but I want to raise the same questions. So whose judgments are represented in this? You know, who decides what um, what the uh, what the price of solar is going to be in twenty one hundred relative to today? Well, you know, we can we can make a sensible expert judgment about that. We can draw the curves. We can think about what might happen in the future. Um, but different people can reasonably have different opinions about this. Um, we can we can have different opinions about, for example, nuclear energy. Speaking to a German audience, of course, you're going to have uh, a variety of opinions about the the acceptability, the feasibility, and the uh, you know the contribution that nuclear power ought to make to a zero carbon decarbonized system. And we see that in the models as well that some of them make uh, stronger assumptions about nuclear than others. Um. So. Again, you know, what's not there? So we don't have, for example, a uh, a, a, a value here for um, behavior change, for example. So supposing that we put behavior change into these models, and basically what they're doing is a cost optimization. They are basically working out what the what the price of different energy supply um, technologies will be over this period, and then saying, well, basically, let's just use whatever's cheapest in order to get us to 2100 and meet whatever the constraints are that we've imposed. Um, and so if we put behavior change in at, uh, say, $2 per tonne of carbon dioxide avoided, then the models would use a huge amount of it because that would be cheap relative to other technologies and lots of it would happen. If you put behavior change in at $2,000 per tonne of CO2 avoided, then it would be expensive relative to other technologies and none of it would happen. So, so that's a sort of first order um, difference in what you're going to get at the end. Now, of course, if you choose not to include behavior change at all, then you're effectively making a judgment that the cost of it is infinite, right? That you're making an assumption um, that, you know, quotes, as somebody said, the American way of life is non-negotiable. Um, and so that that boundary condition, you know, by not talking about that boundary condition, you're imposing it extremely strongly within this modeling environment. And I could give other examples there, but I'm going to skip on um, for the purpose of time. So, you know, you might like to think, 
of the same questions, the same ethical questions when you're thinking about your uh, digital twins or your city modeling or, you know, whichever, whichever aspect of this question you find yourself tackling, um, whose judgments are being represented within these models? Who decides what's politically feasible and what's not, you know, and what's technically feasible and what's not? Because these are judgments you know they're they're not things that necessarily have a definitive answer what value judgments end up being embedded within your choices of representations and i think really importantly what's not there as well as what is there what's what's not there that could be there okay and i'll leave you to stew on that but i'm going to move on and talk about ensembles of models so in the um in the climate change space, weather and climate, uh, people are very keen on ensembles of models. And what that means for anyone who hasn't come across the term before is it, it just means when you have a group of models. So if you think back to my uh, PhD question, looking at these different models of North Atlantic storms, um, what I was looking at was an ensemble of models. I had, you know, well, actually maybe sort of 30 or 40 by the end. Um, but I had this set of models and I had to kind of say, what can I get out of looking at all of these different um, outputs? What, how can I bring them together? So let's say we have an ensemble of models, right? So this is the mathematical bit, okay? No equations, don't worry. Um, we have a set of models, here they are. Uh, so let's say we have a set of models. Um, it could be a city model, it could be a climate model, it could be an energy system model, it could be an epidemiological model. But you've said, I've got one model and I'm not sure how confident I ought to be in it. So I'm going to make several other models. Maybe you vary the initial conditions, maybe you change the parameters of the model, or maybe you go halfway around the world and find somebody else who's made a model of the same situation, making totally different assumptions or using different data and you want to compare them. Right. So that should be familiar. You know, we, we do that because we hope that by taking different perspectives, we'll be able to get more confidence in the output. OK, so so we've got our seven different models. Here they are. So how are we going to make some kind of inference from the characteristics of these seven different models about reality, about about the real world where we live? Because we don't live in model land. We know that none of these cats, cute as they are, none of them is the real system that we're trying to make a decision about. But we can see that these models have things in common. So they have a very similar structure. Um, they have similar characteristics. Maybe they behave in quite similar ways. Um, they've all got four paws and two ears and two eyes and a tail. Although some of them we can't see the tail, maybe it's not represented. Um, and they're kind of, you know, there's a distribution of colors and patterns and you know, size, but the, the, you know, there's a lot in common here, right? And we hope that there is a lot in common because we hope that, that we're representing something real. So what are we going to do? So you have many statistical options open to you here. And you could you could say, so you're going to go, you're going to go out and look for some data, right? So this is our first escape from model land is to go out and look for some data that we didn't use to calibrate these models and use that ideally to choose between the models or to decide how to use them. So let's do that, okay? So data, here it is in the, in the bottom left of the slide, if you can't see it there. Um, so there's our data and it looks like a tail perhaps, could be a tail. Um, it's got fur, definitely. Uh, it's sort of, you know, a, a light yellowy color. Uh, so we go back to our set of models and we say, how am I going to use this data to constrain my choice of the models or to work with these models more effectively? So am I going to, for example, um, choose the one model which looks most consistent with that data? Maybe it's this one, you know, maybe that tail looks a bit like the other tail. It's got the right length of fur and it's roughly the right color. So maybe I say, maybe I say this model here in the top right hand corner is the best model. I'm going to select that model based on the data that I've taken, and I'm going to throw away all the others and use that model to make um, inferences about reality. You could do that. That's one option. That's model selection. Alternatively, you could say, well, maybe I don't feel confident ruling out all of the others. Maybe what I'm going to do instead is 
is sort of rank them by their consistency with this data. Maybe that one's the best, and then maybe this one's the right color, and maybe the other five are all much of a muchness. Maybe maybe these two here are slightly better color, and these two, these three at the bottom are probably the least consistent with the data. So maybe I say, I'm going to average these two and add a little bit of those two and maybe downweight these three to zero. And I could combine them in that way to make inferences about reality. Well, you could do that. You know, that's a model model weighting. You can. There are complex Bayesian methods for doing this. There are Bayesian model selection and model averaging procedures. So you could do any of that. You could you could choose to do any of that. Okay, and those would be sort of reasonable. But we don't. We haven't taken very much data. So. Supposing we go back and we take more data. Now, supposing for the purposes of uh, of this discussion that we have omniscient knowledge of the system and we can go and observe the whole system. So I'm going to do that now. And you probably, I expect half of you are way ahead of me and you've guessed exactly where this is going, but I'm going to reveal what reality looks like now. Ta-da. And okay, it's a dog. So it's not within the candidate set of our models. So our models were all these set of seven cats. Reality is this dog. So was it justified to go back and select a single model? Would it be justified to go back and select, you know, and, and to kind of weight these models by their consistency with that data? Is that actually going to help us? Well, not necessarily really, is it? You know, the fact that this one has slightly lighter fur doesn't make it closer to being a golden retriever than any of the others. No. So, you know, we I think we really have to think about what we're doing. We really have to think about what these statistical methods actually mean and imply. In in a world, in a perfect world where our models were perfect and we knew that they had the correct structure, then we could do these statistical things and get loads of really useful confident information out of them. But in a world, in a world where we know that all our models are wrong, where we know that they have structural inadequacies and imperfections, where we understand that our perspectives are limited um, and that we can't fully gather enough data to be able to fully constrain these models, uh, then you know, we need some humility about what we can statistically do with our models. And you know, when I say that, I don't want to kind of lead you all the way to thinking, well, these models are terrible, because by the by, you know, actually that set of seven cats was really quite informative about the dog. Not perfect, but pretty good. You know, the behavior is similar-ish, not the same, but similar. The, um, what it eats is similar, not the same, but similar. If you were a veterinarian who had been trained to, uh, to, you know, to work on cats, you could probably have a pretty good go at fixing almost anything that was wrong with the dog based on your knowledge of the cats. And so from a decision-making perspective, it is absolutely not critical that your models are wrong. Your models can be wrong. Your models can be inadequate. Your models will always be inadequate, but your models can be good enough for the purpose of making decisions without being perfect and without giving us perfect, fully confident information. But let's think about what we would need to do uh, with our set of cats in order to make them more informative about this dog. Well, they're probably quite similar to each other because we have, you know, because they've been built by a set of people who have similar understanding of the world, maybe similar educational background, similar training. Maybe you've even inherited model code from a previous postdoc or, or looked in a paper for what somebody else did and you're kind of building on what they did. And that's good and natural. That's okay. That's that's not in itself a problem. But what it results in is dependencies between all these different models, such that we can't fully consider them to be a, a diverse representation of all possible outcomes of models. So how could we make our model system such that, you know, rather than having a set of cats which are totally separate from this dog, that we had a set which could perhaps, you know, in a way that the philosophers would say is not well defined, <laughs> but hopefully intuitively you understand what I mean. Um, you know, that, that kind of a space that spans 
you know, a set that might contain a dog rather than a set that clearly doesn't contain a dog. Okay. Um, and so you can imagine what that would be, right? So let's say a set of mammals. So we have a fox and a cat and a tiger and a pig and a bunch of other mammals in there. Then the dog is kind of within the range a lot more than when you had your set of uh, very similar cats. And I think this is actually very often the case that our models are much closer to each other and look more similar to each other than they do to reality. So in order to construct a set of models wh where reality could more reasonably be thought of as being within that set, um, we need to be pushing the, the kinds of modeling that we're doing towards diversity. We need to be pushing the edges and the boundaries instead of trying to make models which agree with each other and, you know, I think this is quite common in science that we try to make a model which agrees with the previous model. We try to we try to build consensus in results. We try to, you know, we, we try to find agreement because it's kind of nice to find agreement and it's confirmatory and it feels good and it's um, it feels like you're getting closer to the truth. But I think there is a danger of groupthink that actually it doesn't help us to buy you know, as one philosopher said, to buy more copies of the morning newspaper to assure ourselves that what it says is true. It, that doesn't give us any additional confidence. What would give us additional confidence in this in this kind of model environment is by pushing our models in all these different ways as far apart as we possibly can. If we still find that they have a common core of robust projections, then that is extremely useful because that gives us very high confidence. If we have tried to get something else and failed, rather than if we constantly try to get the same answer. If we constantly try to get the same answer, then basically we will get the same answer, but we don't know what it means. We don't know whether it's a useful answer. And so in order to uh, generate this diversity of models, uh, one of the main theses of my book is that we need more diversity of modelers, of people involved in modelling. We need people coming from different backgrounds, from different perspectives. We need people with different kinds of training attacking the same problem in different ways, because then we will have a model ensemble which has the fox and the tiger and the pig, as well as a bunch of cats. And then we will have a better handle, mathematically and statistically, on the levels of uncertainty that we truly have in our projections, if that's what we're trying to do. If we're trying to project the future or we're trying to project the um, the outcome of a certain policy or an action or a decision, then we want to have confidence in that. You know, this whole thing is about finding confidence and justified confidence. Okay, so just to kind of wrap up, the... Um, the challenges for modelers then, I think, that are here and, and that we can talk more about. Firstly, are getting out of model land. So this this step of, of kind of realizing that there are values, there are social and political content within these models, um, that we need to think about this really hard um, and that our statistical methods don't necessarily work off the shelf, that we have to think about those as well. Um, but also, as I kind of alluded to before, we need to not throw the baby out with the bathwater. We can't go, oh, it's all too difficult. You know, these models don't mean anything. We should just throw them away because they contain useful information. They contain our best expert judgments. They contain the data that we've taken. They contain all sorts of relevant and useful things. They're just one perspective of potentially many perspectives. So ensuring that we remain able to use these models and remain able to um, integrate imperfect information without fixating on on the problems with it you know that it, it may be it, it it indeed it is imperfect information we cannot know what the future is going to look like but we can get really useful um, indications out of these models about what it might look like so um just to summarize then, the the question of how we build these exits from model land, I think um, first requires us to think very carefully about the question that we're trying to answer. And that means um, understanding our value judgments and thinking about, you know, what would a good outcome be? You know, you just add in the word good there. That's going to be an expert judgment. That's going to include social, political 
personal value judgments about what is the outcome you're trying to achieve and what it would look like. Um, so understanding what is the question that we're trying to answer. We are not just trying to answer the question, how do I build the best possible model of a city? We are saying, you know, we want to equip our cities to deal with um, future climate change or future demographic changes or et cetera, et cetera, you know, fill in your own blanks there. And I think, you know, probably, I don't know your research area, but I feel that that's something that you're probably quite good at already. Um, and that's something that physical scientists actually struggle with a lot more because we, as, um, you know, as physical scientists, we tend to think that the physical thing is out there and is independent of our value judgments and our motivations. And so we just like to build the biggest possible model that will be the most accurate thing and and then let the decision makers work on, on uh, interpreting it. Um, so probably you with your more, more social um, object of study probably are already way ahead of climate and climate physics in thinking about these sorts of questions. Then the second one is learning from diverse perspectives. Um, so as I kind of sketched with the dog and the cats and the other animals, you know, that, that we need we need these diverse perspectives, not just because diversity is socially good for us all, but because it is important for the mathematics and the statistics of our interpretation of model output. You know, that's that's kind of my bottom line is that if we want to be able to make good models, we have to be able to make diverse models and therefore we have to be incorporating multiple perspectives. And then the third one is embracing uncertainty. And my um, my sort of favorite quote at the moment with, with regards to models is this idea that the best way to predict the future is to create it because models are not, models are really not there solely to predict the future. We're not you know, coming back to that question, why are we doing this? What's the point? We're not doing this to predict the future. Nobody is actually interested solely in what the future will be. We're interested in understanding what the future could be in order to make better decisions in the present, in order to create a better future. Um, and so the models, they're kind of the way I think about them as, is as active participants in this decision-making process, in this, in this creative process of imagining what a future could be thinking about the the actions that we can take in the present to achieve that better future um, and then hopefully facilitating the conversations and the judgments and the actions that make that possible. All right, thank you very much. I really welcome any thoughts on that because uh, you know I know I've given a lot of talks to different audiences and they have uh, come from very different perspectives and you know again this question of diversity actually is really important to me in my research as well, because you will come with different ideas and understandings of how you use models and what kinds of models are relevant and what kinds of methods work for you. Um, so I'm really interested to hear the reflections back of, of where this kind of meshes with things that you're already doing or conflicts completely. I mean, that would be really interesting um, or you know, any general feedback. So thank you so much. And I'll hand back to Rico, I think. Yes, thank you so so much, Erica, for for first of all giving the talk and and summarizing it so well, talking about this whole spectrum of models and what can we do with it, what can we not do with it. I'm very sure that there are um, a lot of questions from a lot of different domains. We have uh, sociologists, cultural researchers here, um, philosophers as well. So I'm, I'm pretty sure there will be a lot um, to kick off the um, the conversation and the discussion. I. Um, I also have one one question just following up on your last uh, escape route from model land, which is um, about uncertainty and embracing uncertainty. Um, and what we often see because we work in a very applied environment with city officials is that um, the political culture is in a way that certainty is needed. So um, decision makers, at least in some areas, tend to, to want to have certainty in the models. Um, be that a cost benefit analysis where you say this new tram line will have this expected return on investment in 10 years, or if that's environmental impact assessment, whatever. Um, if you come and say, well, there's a range of models and embrace the uncertainty, they will never give you money again. 
so the questions um like to put it very very frankly and maybe also to overstate a little bit um so the question is a little bit how can we as scientists as modelers um how can we embrace actually uncertainty in a in this political culture yeah i mean i think that's a really good question and we see it we see it of course in many other domains as well and the the sort of classic idea that the decision maker just wants an answer you know just tell me what to do and um maybe i would link this back uh with you know climate and epidemiology this idea of follow the science which is very popular um and i kind of think that this question of following the science is a an accountability failure because it's putting on the science it's it's putting all the value judgments back to the science you know which which should be value judgments made by decision makers um so i think if we can somehow frame the uncertainty in a way that says you know you have you have choices we don't know exactly what the outcomes are going to be um that the science you know is not value neutral and is never going to be value neutral but but that the large scale values and decisions um should be coming from the policymaker rather than from the science. Uh, I mean, yeah, what do you do when they just want a single answer? You can't do very much and you you have to, to some extent, you have to go with what they want because as you say, otherwise either you're not going to get funding and that maybe is one concern, but equally that they will just throw away the scientific information and revert to other less scientific decision-making inputs, you know, they'll just go with their gut feel or they'll go with something that's politically salient or politically attractive at the moment um, without even considering that information. And so I think that there's a balancing act there. And realistically, in some cases, you have to, you know, you, you basically have to give the decision-maker what they want um, in order to have any seat at the table and that feels a bit uncomfortable and it's you know not the ideal answer um but hopefully what you do in the process of that is you build a relationship and you you build a relationship with the decision maker that can be more of an ongoing thing that you can say to them well you know what are, what dimensions of uncertainty are you finding most uncomfortable and maybe you go back and think about how to you know, either how to present that a bit more clearly, how to distinguish between the options a bit more clearly or the scenarios to present it in a different way that will sort of make more intuitive sense. Um, or ideally, you sort of bring them closer to you, you know, you you bring them into a more conversational relationship of let's think about, let's think about how we would represent this. And something that I've seen done really nicely on a couple of occasions is is having, you know, I mean, not necessarily totally participatory model development, although that's fantastic as well, but you may find people just don't have time for it, but a more kind of gamified communication of the outputs of the model where you say, um, you know, let's present it as a web page where you have all these different inputs and you can, you can kind of slide them and get a nice visualization. And you can say, you know, we're going to, I mean, it obviously totally depends what your buttons are, but but you you change those options and that the policymaker can kind of play around with them and get a feel that, oh, you know, if I change this one a little bit, it makes a big difference to the output or I change this one a huge amount and it makes no difference at all. So let's not think about that one. Um, and I think that, you know, if you can engineer that, and of course you're always subject to the constraints that decision makers just don't necessarily have very much time for these things. Um, then you can develop a relationship which is able to talk about uncertainty a bit more. I mean, maybe I would backtrack slightly on the embracing uncertainty and say that from the communication perspective, I think the word uncertainty is actually very unhelpful and we should be framing things in terms of confidence rather than uncertainty. Like if you look uncertainty up in a dictionary, you get all sorts of awful synonyms like doubt, mistrust, lack of faith, you know, like terrible things, you know, unreliability, uh, like have a, have a look in a dictionary sometime. You get the, the, the synonyms for uncertainty are really, really politically problematic. Um, 
And so flipping everything around and framing in terms of confidence, I think can help quite a lot. Uh, so maybe instead of embracing uncertainty, that should have been throw away the uncertainty and talk about confidence instead. But from a scientific perspective, we need to embrace the uncertainty. I don't know if that gives a few pointers to how, I mean, it's a really perennially difficult question that you've put your finger on there. And I don't know, I don't have any great answers to it. I don't know if I, um, I, I can moderate some, I think Kim was, was the first one to raise her hand. Yeah, thanks Rico. And also thanks a lot, Erica, for this really illuminating presentation, super interesting. I have a corollary question to follow up on Rico's question, which is similar, but I'd like to know if you have any experiences or examples with communicating this to the public, because I think just as decision makers struggle with these concepts, there's also um, the public struggling with the choices made by decision makers or the way that especially in, in under climate change, science is presented to them. So I don't know if you have any uh, yeah, experiences there. Yeah, sure. Um, so, I mean, maybe first to say that I've done, obviously I've written my book and my book is aimed at more or less public audiences. Um, although I found that I have got a lot more back from the um, semi-technical end of the community, you know, from people in um, in jobs where they're perhaps doing a bit of modeling, maybe in Excel, you know, maybe fair, maybe pretty low level modeling, um, but they're trying to work out how to communicate with the sort of managerial next level up. Um, and so that's not general public per se. Um, and I am not quite sure how you present this to the public because there's always this balance between saying that the models are uncertain and difficult to interpret and value laden. And as soon as that get, I mean, I'm sure you have the equivalent newspapers, <laughs> but that gets into the Daily Mail or the Telegraph here and they, and they just run with it and say, well, you know, we should be, we can't trust these models. They are full of an agenda which is political. Um, we should be, we should just throw them away. Um, and so I'm constantly kind of treading that line. And that's kind that's also kind of why I wrote a book which was not about climate change. Like my background is climate and my interest and expertise is primarily climate, but I wanted to write a book that wasn't primarily about climate change because I felt that it would be misinterpreted um, as being skeptical about the ability of uh, climate models to provide useful information. And I am absolutely skeptical about the ability of climate models to provide detailed projections of what the future will look like, but I'm not at all skeptical about their ability to provide useful information. You know, I think we get all sorts of useful things from them. And so um, we like, we can see the same kinds of questions arising in public health, uh, the epidemiology, all of the questions following um, the decision making about COVID um, and the lockdowns and the questions of how uh, different interests and different um, perspectives could or should or might have been incorporated into that decision making procedure, especially in those very early days. And I think they raise good questions. You know, I think uh, ultimately, these are questions that have to be answered, and I hope that I go some way towards answering them. Um, what can you do to kind of stay in the middle of that and not end up being um, sort of uh, attacked by both sides, in a sense? Um, I think transparency and openness are the are critical. I think you have to be open to different perspectives, which might take different value judgments. So, I mean, to take a little sketch, supposing supposing I got picked up a pack of cards from the from the desk here, and I said I'm going to predict the next card, and I hold it up and I get it right, and then I hold the next one up and I get that right and right and right. You know, does that make you think that I can uh, that I'm somehow psychic? You know, that I have psychic powers? No, of course not, because you know that I'm cheating. Now, supposing I ask you to pick one up and hold it up and I predict it and then I predict it again and again. Well, that gives you more confidence, right? Because you're able to control the situation better. And so I think what we need, 
thinking about maybe vaccine hesitancy, for example, just coming out with more scientific studies saying we are more confident that this is a good thing is never going to work. You have to allow people to take part and to satisfy themselves that it is uh that you know that the experiment is being conducted correctly and in good faith that's the only way and that's really difficult you know this this sort of participatory modeling and in particular um gathering perspectives from people who might be skeptical of the scientific process per se they might not want to engage with it but ultimately that is probably the only way to do it just hitting them with more science isn't going to help because it that will be kind of contaminated for if in their in their view in the same way that all the rest of it was. Um, so again, you've asked a very uh, complex and difficult question to which I don't really have a satisfying answer. Um, but I think you know if I have any short and sweet answer to it, it's transparency and co-production. Uh, here can. Yeah, thank you, Erica, for this really inspiring and thought-provoking input. I um, really, really liked it. I especially love your way how to use metaphors and kind of very nice um, pictures. It's like it's really a pleasure to to listen to you. Um, I have a question because I think that our perception of the world is somehow really formed by models and statistics um yep. and i mean the answer obviously is to have a diverse a more diverse kind of um yeah mo model system maybe um and as being a cultural uh, scientist myself I'm, i'm heading a project called thinking cities where we try to somehow embed cultural heritage as a decisive factor for climate adaption i wonder how you see this super hard task to include qualitative data into such um, models, because the translation obviously is not really helpful. And um, I mean, the translation of qualitative mm -hmm. data into, into numeric kind of systems. And this is something that I guess we all struggle with or certain regards of social components and so on. So if, you, if you're talking about like a set of models and diversity of models, is there something that you came across where you would say, okay, this is a qualitative model somehow that is um is a good kind of way how to how to do that okay uh great question i have lots of thoughts on that um so maybe i could start with um start with a quote that i uh that i mentioned in my book from nasim taleb who says probability is a qualitative subject I absolutely think that probability is a qualitative subject and that modeling is also a qualitative subject um, and that the outputs that we get from our models are not really quantitative. You know, they, they're framed in terms of models, but they effectively represent expert judgments. And so the way that we combine multiple models It, as I as I sort of showed with the cat and the dog, it doesn't make sense to do that with mathematics and statistics, really. It only makes sense to do that by saying, you know, these these seven models represent seven different expert judgments about what, say, the future might be like. Um, and if we do that, then we could say, actually, we could reasonably incorporate totally qualitative models on the same level um, as our quantitative models. How you then feed that? I mean, what, I think one of the problems is that uh, over the last 50 years, you know, maybe 100 years, that we have moved towards quantification of everything. Um, and because of having bigger and better computers and better access to computers, which is obviously a good thing, we've also turned towards modeling everything. <laughs> and towards cost benefit analysis and and the and the way that economics has you know completely become a quantitative subject um and everything has to be in equations and everything has to be quantified and also everything then has to be reduced to the one dimensional uh dollar quantity in order to be able to do a cost benefit analysis and make a decision i mean this as far as i'm concerned is completely ridiculous and there is a there is a bit of a rant about this in my book <laughs> if you're interested but um but that modelization that that financialization and modelization and quantification sort of all go together um 
and they squeeze out all of the intangibles, all of the other things that genuinely matter to people. You know, how could we trade off, um, you know, the benefit of comu commuting time, like uh, by increasing the width of a road outside a school versus the air quality impacts on the health of those people in the school. I mean, like, yes, you can do it. Of course you can do it. You know, you can assign a numerical value to anything you like and get an answer. But does this make sense? Like this, this uh, assertion that everything is fungible, that everything can be traded off against everything else in dollar value, I really strongly object to. And I think that models are one of the reasons pushing us to, to do that and to make these assumptions. Um, and so I find that, I, I think that pushing back against that, both methodologically in the way that we make and use models and in the way that we integrate models, along with all of the other considerations that go into a decision, um, into operational decision-making procedures. I think I just think that's really important, you know, to say that the, you know, the cultural heritage of a city is important to it in just the same way as economic benefits are. Um, and that these, we shouldn't feel that we have to um, quantify everything in order for it to have value. How do you do that? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> so again, I'm going to say, sorry, I don't really have an answer. How do we do this? I mean, I think it comes back to this kind of uh, um, narrative and scenario uh, judgment rather than just trying to predict and optimize, you know, getting away from this idea of prediction and optimization um, but telling stories about why we can't just do that. And so I hope that that's one of the contributions of my book is to kind of explain the limitations of modeling and the value ladenness of modeling and that and that we shouldn't just be rushing to do more and more of it, um, that we should be making the most of its ability where we can and where we have the data and where we have the confidence, but equally that we need to be um, aware of the boundaries of model land and living in the real world. Thank you. Um, Abby. Thank you, Erica. Um, thanks, Rico, for suggesting. Erica gives us a great presentation. Um, and it's, uh, yeah, been great food for thought. I, I'm interested in your idea of what's good enough and if it's totally context dependent, because I think of uh, fiscal policy and macroeconomic uh, instruments to influence behavior or, you know, increase the interest rate, national interest rate, and people will start saving more or increase public spending and increase uh, the rate of, uh, you know, money, um, money circulating in the economy. That perhaps in that sense, instance, good enough is some improvement is seen in the economy, but obviously not everyone is now going to improve savings or not every department is going to increase spending. But with, for instance, uh, energy modeling, it's, um, and the transmission, you know, distribution system for electricity needs to be more precise. And it's not good enough that um, some power stations aren't able to uh, offload their electricity. If it's not, that's not good enough. But it would be good enough if there was extra or um, excess capacity for some kind of, um, you know, electricity grid. So I wonder if it is totally context dependent. What's good enough and and if it's all, if it's also okay for the public to know some and not everything of these models and their application, because the good enough it determines that some people will behave in the way that was expected and and some won't. Yeah. So I mean, good enough, I guess, is a function of whether it's achieving the outcomes that you're seeking to uh, inform. Um, and so I come back to so philosopher Wendy Parker talks about this idea of adequacy for purpose, that a model can be adequate for one purpose and not adequate for another. So as I said, sort of physicists and people with a physical science background tend to just construct the best possible model on the grounds that that will be best for any purpose that you might want to put it to. But that's obviously not true because we could put more effort into um, describing one part of the system or into another part. Um, 
I think it's interesting that you mention economic modeling and energy system modeling, because those are two areas where I really see the uh, the models as being um, very constructive and very active, um, that models in those domains are not about predicting the future, they're about creating the future. Um, and as uh, Donald McKenzie said, they are an engine, not a camera, you know, they are that they are active, not just taking a picture of what reality is like, but helping to create that reality as you construct the model. Um, and that's by the influence that the model might have on the way that decision makers think, um, on the way that they understand different parts of the system to be related to each other, or it might even be more direct than that. I mean, if you think about a central bank um, making projections of um, inflation, GDP, and all that sort of thing, I mean, they they kind of just will just project something middle of the road. But of course, if a central bank were to predict that next week the inflation will be terrible and GDP will be down 30%, then everybody would pass in prophecy because, because that model is active within the system. It's uh, It has this sort of performativity built in. Um, and so I see performativity in a very wide range of models, energy system models, um, this question of whether they include behavior change or not, for example, uh, the questions of what assumptions we make about technological development and um, the price of different technologies in future. You know, you can you can sort of, the, the model pushes reality because you say, we have a model in which the only way to meet our Paris Agreement targets in 2100 is to rely heavily on negative emissions. Hopefully, <laughs> that stimulates development of negative emissions technologies in order to make that come true. I mean, possibly also there's a degree of counterperformativity there in that people go, ah, oh, the market will sort it all out for me. I don't need to think about it. Um, and the government says, well, there, here's our energy system pathway to 2100. And oh, yes, it includes lots of negative emissions technologies, uh, but that's predicted to happen. So I don't need to do anything. But I mean, you, like, you, can, you can see the complexity of this, of this interaction of model with, with real world. Um, Thank you. So Those are thrilling thoughts. <laughs> your second question was about um, the sort of transparency and whether uh, the public should be able to see these things. I mean, I think, I, I mean, it depends totally on what it is. Um, and I think if it's, if it's something like climate change, um, then of course the, the, you know, the guts of these models is completely incomprehensible, even to somebody with a PhD in climate science, because you only end up understanding a small corner of the model. And they're constructed by thousands of people with different expertise. So nobody can understand all of a climate model. Um, but I think that we can understand and we can increase the model literacy of the general public. And again, that's sort of what my book was aimed at doing. And I hope that it goes some way towards this, but to, um, to help the general public feel that you know, confronted with this kind of scientific monolith saying, follow the science, that they can that they can interrogate that and that they have the right to ask questions about the model and the value judgments that underlie it um, and the implications of that model, uh, even if they don't understand the detail of what's going on in the guts of the model, because that requires you know, a huge amount of training to do. And so and so I think finding that language to be able to critique models and to be able to um, have a conversation about model information, model output, and the way that models are integrated into decision-making procedures, I think that's really, really valuable. I, I mean, I'd like to see more of that. And that, as I said, that's kind of why I wrote the book. Uh, thank you, um, Alexander. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thanks a lot, Erica. I've seen you speak virtually a few times now, and this was another <laughs> brilliant talk. So thank you very much. Um, my question is about uh, this that you, you touched on the the borrowing of code and interactions between modeling communities that ends up sort of leading to d convergence rather than divergence. So if we're pushing for more divergence and diversity in models, 
Um, I'm also conscious, I'm a PhD student as part of the climate science excellence cluster here in Hamburg, and they obviously have a you know, Ferrari model um, at the yeah. Max Planck Institute. And there's a couple of other big uh, research institutes like that around the world. So if, if those are the incumbents and they get all the attention, they get all the funding, how could, yeah, what are some strategies to, to so that we could make inroads into um, increased ex uh, acceptability or, or greater credence for or simple models that might be hugely informative, but they're not as fancy or as detailed as these these big Ferrari models. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, this is an area of active research for me, and I hopefully have a paper coming out fairly soon, fingers crossed, on uh, on sort of feminist approach in climate modelling and thinking about exactly this question of how do we how do we get away from the stranglehold that the state of the art models have on provision of climate information you know not because they're wrong or bad you know they're great and they absolutely have their place and i'm not saying you know uh, i'm not saying that they don't provide useful information um but they provide a particular type of information which is relevant for a particular type of climate service customer okay so if you're an insurance company and you have a portfolio of investment across the world and you're interested in sort of knowing the relative risk in these different places and uh, like and you have a very quantitative approach already and you've got an in-house technical scientific capacity to deal with this information then the outputs of the state of the art climate models are incredibly useful to you okay but supposing you're a smallholder farmer in sub-saharan africa you know it is completely meaningless um supposing you're uh you know, I mean, just supposing that you're interested in one specific location rather than a portfolio of assets, um, then actually the uncertainty begins to swamp you. Because if you're interested in this large global portfolio of assets, then then probably the uncertainties, you know, there's a quite a lot of uncertainty about any individual place, but they kind of cancel out and you get a, basically get a general signal of what the answer is going to be. And you have enough relative information to be able to do something useful. But if you're if you only have one shop, which is, you know, three meters above sea level near Miami, uh, what are you going to do? Uh, is this actually relevant information? Um, and you don't have the technical ability to download and deal with the sort of probability quantiles of the distribution, and you don't know what the scenarios mean. And like, this is not, it's genuinely not useful information. And so I think actually a focus on the the customer for climate information and thinking more about the use cases rather than just saying the biggest, bestest, fastest, you know, most computationally expensive model must be the best for every possible use case. And so we do see some move towards that. You know, we see people developing storylines, developing scenario approaches to modeling, developing more uh, sort of smaller scale um bottom up modeling also the you know the the lower resolution um but faster climate models which are sort of a couple of steps back from the from the state of the art ones saying that we can use those to generate a larger ensemble i mean there are loads of things you can do right there's uh, there's so many different things and ways that you can present climate information um that don't necessarily completely rely on the big state of the art models the ferrari models as you say i quite like that um, you know, not everybody can afford a Ferrari and not everybody wants one. And, you know, it won't drive well down a mud track. <laughs> Somebody needs a Land Rover. Somebody needs a bicycle. So I absolutely think that we need more diversity in climate information provision, but without saying that there isn't a place for the Ferrari. Thank you very much. Um, looking at the time, I think there is one more question from Yuming, and then I would have a, a final question to close the session. Yuming, please. Thank you, Rico, and thank you, Erica, for the very informative um, presentation. I really like the idea of ensemble of models for the diversity, and I think I, I have a question about incorporating this ensemble of models to incorporate the diversity there, and I think some points are already discussed. So uh, I see that it's not really realistic to have a united um, quantitative uh, optimization 
for distributing this uh, objectives, optimized objectives for all the parties in the model. So uh, as my understanding, there are ensembles of models that they represent different parties and they, there are different value judgments embedded in there. And in the process of incorporating those models, how do we adjust the dependencies between them because there are a conflict of interest. And for example, you mentioned the participatory method Oh, that there is a, a UI that someone can drag and adjusting different parameters to see mm -hmm. how this would impact the final um, outcome. But is this also another way that implicitly this person who's adjusting this is kind of doing the model weighting, that this person is weighting different um, components? How can we uh, help those, those uh, parties who are currently underrepresented and how can their voices be raised in the final decision making process. Do you have other approaches there? Thank you. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Um, so thinking about that kind of user interface with the, you know, twiddling the levers. Um, I think, I think what's valuable about that is not so much getting people to find an answer that they like as helping them to understand that there are multiple possible answers. And so it, you know, come coming back to the question about helping people to understand uncertainty if you can say you know this has been produced by experts and you can choose you know your value of this lever from sort of middle of the range plausible to highly optimistic to pretty pessimistic uh then it, it helps them to understand that actually you know maybe maybe i can make my judgments but maybe i find that all of my judgments are on the highly optimistic end of every lever well that's quite informative if you say you know, if you're saying I'm being optimistic about this, but I'm being maybe middle of the road or pessimistic or a bit optimistic about all these other things, then you think that's okay. But if you find yourself being optimistic about everything, then you think, hmm, you know, why why does my why do why do my judgments differ in this way? And I think that's a helpful starting point for a conversation. And I mean, again, I suppose I find the the model to be more a helpful starting point for a conversation than anything else. It, it's kind of facilitative. It's a, it's a boundary object which helps somebody without the technical knowledge talk to and understand somebody with the technical knowledge. Um, you know, and, and kind of on their territory, and maybe we need to find more ways of having these conversations on the other territory because people who are technically inclined, the modeling community might find it quite difficult to talk to somebody without a modeling background on that ter on the territory of values and this kind of fuzzy understanding and incommensurables, things which don't add up with each other. Um, maybe we need to get more con comfortable with that as well as bringing other people to be more comfortable with our technical environment. Um, so where did your question go after that? You said, um, what can we do? Sorry, I've forgotten what the last bit was. That's fine. I think the last one was, what approaches do we have to increase the voices of the underrepresented parties? And yeah, that's right. Yeah. Um, well, I think I think we just need to be more humble about modeling in general and the scientific um, the whole scientific domain that we have we have this technical, knowledge and understanding, which is great, but it's only one part of the decision, you know, that we can't go from a forecast of what the future might be like directly to a decision. We have to, we have to make a value judgment about what we think is the right answer. What are we trying to create? What kind of future are we trying to create? And so this goes back to the kind of co-production as well, that actually, if we can really examine before starting out on the research, what it is that we're trying to achieve, what decisions we're trying to inform, and what the and what the values of the project are. And again, for a physical scientist like me, that feels pretty uncomfortable. That's quite difficult to do. Um, but having done that, I think that we have a more robust platform that in which we can bring in these other voices. We can we can help to identify them from the beginning and say what kinds of outputs are the right kinds of outputs how do we how do we bring those voices in and how do we incorporate them somehow into the into the scientific process so again sorry not really an answer but hopefully some pointers
Thank you. Um, yes, so, so a lot of starting points. I think a lot of um, discussion around the power of quantitization and power of models and how to deal with them. Um, so maybe my looking at the time, my, my last, what was supposed to be a question is now more like a statement. Um, because you also talk in the book about that we, we would need an ethical framework for modeling and simulation, especially for the modelers. And it also ties well into what you just said with talking to each other and stepping out of your territory and crossing the boundaries and in, in, interdisciplinary work. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe for us all left to wonder, we can wonder about why something like this doesn't doesn't already exist. And maybe we should push for that and and make that in the future when it comes to digital twins and all of the city models that are being developed and integrated with the climate models and the economic models and the mobility models and so on. Maybe there needs to be a lot more discussion around uh, the ethics of all of that. So with that being said, um, Erika, thank you so much for, for this uh, insightful talk and uh, spending time with us and um, um, giving your insights. Um,